Hello and welcome to Inside the Admissions Office, your one-stop shop for expert advice on the smart way to get in. My name is Kayla and each episode I'll bring you an interview with a former admissions officer, a graduate of a top college, or an admissions expert. These interviews will take you inside the admissions office and will be full of behind-the-scenes knowledge, first-hand experiences, and application tips that will help you get into your dream school. If you'd like to chat with one of these experts, you can sign up for a free consultation at the link in the description of this episode. But before you do that, let's hear from Jody Furman, a graduate coach from UNC Chapel Hill and Columbia Business School, about the activities list. Hi, Jody. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So today we are going to be talking about the all-important activities list, um, the very important kind of extracurricular section of the common application. And you are one of our graduate coaches. You work with a lot of students and you also um, in you know the professional world have read a lot of resumes um, as a headhunter. So I thought you would be a really good person to talk to about kind of what looks good on kind of a resume type you know, part of the application. Yeah, I mean, the activities list really is essentially your resume. It's the way that you're able to communicate and to convey the things that you've accomplished, whether they're tasks or activities, awards. It also has a very limited amount of characters. So we need to be really judicious about using those characters and that real estate that's extremely limited to communicate as much information as humanly possible. Yeah, definitely. It is really kind of more similar to a resume, as some people might think, you know, with a resume as well. It's very short, very condensed. So definitely. Um, So you kind of explained a little bit right there, but I'm hoping you can just kind of give a broad overview for someone who might be an absolute beginner at the admissions process um, of just what the activities list is. Sure. So the activities list is a list of only 10 activities, and that's all the space that you have. You're also additionally limited to 50 characters for the title, as well as 150 characters for the explanation of what you did. So they're also going to ask you what grades that you did these things in, how many hours per week, and whether you intend to continue those activities in college. So perhaps you row varsity crew and you don't intend to do that in college, you're going to include all that information. Um, There's also an order in which you want to convey that information. So it's not really a descending order, but loosely. Um, And certainly I spent a lot of time with my students, both creating these lists and really strategizing what we want to present first, second, all the way down to number 10. Um, So it is an iterative process. And typically I tell my students, Don't worry at first, obviously we will at the end, about the character count or the order. What I really want them to do is essentially a data dump. I want to know everything that they've done. And not just the things that you would typically include on a resume. I mean, obviously, if you played a sport, if you started a club, if you're the president of a club, if you have a job. Those are things that I think most people know to put on activities lists. But I also want to know the things that you might do that you wouldn't think to include. Maybe you play the ukulele, maybe you ride a unicycle, maybe you do crossword puzzles, maybe you knit and sew and you bake. Whatever it is that you do, I like to include things that really make you three-dimensional. And if you could put yourself in the shoes of the people who sit in admissions offices and all day for weeks on end, they're looking at activities lists and GPAs and reading essays, they all kind of blend into each other. I want to grab their attention by saying that you ride a unicycle. So when they go to committee and they're talking about you, you're the unicyclist who also happens to have fabulous grades and fabulous uh, stats and also has done a lot of other things. I think including something that's a little quirky, a little weird, Um, can sometimes grab their attention in a good way. Now, I don't want all quirky and weird. I definitely want substance. And certainly we're looking for longevity. We're looking for impact. Um, But don't be afraid to include things that you might not typically include on a resume or frankly, even on an activities list. It's not only the things that you've done in school. It's not only the things that you've done in the community. And it's not only the things that you may have done in the corporate world or in a lab. 
Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really great kind of broad overview. And I'm really looking forward to kind of zooming in on some of those points too, sure. as we um, go through today. So I'd love to kind of start by kind of your last point about admissions officers and them, you know, bringing applications to committees. So um, what is the actual process of, you know, admissions officers evaluating this list? What are they really looking for and hoping to see that will make you kind of be you know, a top student in their eyes? Sure. I mean, ultimately, every admissions office has their own flow. So I'm speaking in generalities. Please don't say that this is gospel, that every single admissions officer or every single admissions office uses the same process. But essentially, the first person who reads your resume, as you reads your application, is going to be looking, you know, certainly at your stats and scores. This year, of course, a lot of places are test optional. So they might just be looking at your GPA. They're going to look at your school profile. They're going to look not only at your GPA, but what courses did you take, your course rigor? Um, and ultimately, your GPA and even your ACT or SAT and subject tests, they're not, for the most part, especially for the top echelon of schools, they're not going to get you in. That's not enough. What it is going to do is get you considered. And then they're going to look at everything else. And ultimately, a combination of your personal statement or statements, because a lot of schools do have additional statements beyond just one, um, and your activities list are really the differentiators. It's what takes you from being just a number into a full three-dimensional candidate. And the extracurriculars are really important. And a lot of times, if you speak to the parents of the students that I work with, many of whom are college educated, went to great schools, what schools were looking for in an, even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even five years ago, is vastly different. 10, 15, 20 years ago, you can arrive on campus and be, say, hey, I want to major in business or I want to be a research scientist and I want to specialize in neuroscience or I want to be an engineer. And they're like, sure, you're smart. Go for it. We can do that. Now, <laughs> they want you to have already done research. What diseases have you cured, right? Or they're looking, what businesses have you started? You know, is it listed on the NASDAQ? Um, what is your revenue? How many employees do you have? When it comes to things like an engineer, they want to know what competitions you've been in. What have you done? So they're looking for demonstrated activity that supports your candidacy in whatever it is that you do. And that goes for whether it's comparative literature, philosophy, psychology. They want you to show them demonstrated interest, preferably demonstrated interest that started fairly young in your career. So when I work with my students, not only that are applying, but also students that we do what's called candidacy building, it gives us an opportunity to demonstrate that in interesting ways. And joining clubs is fantastic and it's a great way to be involved in your school community. But for that, again, that very upper echelon of the most selective schools, joining a club is may not be enough. Being the president of that club may not be enough. Perhaps being a founder of a club, maybe making that impact bigger out to your community nationwide. Um, so really I tell students to challenge themselves to think big and certainly we can help to guide them how to get those actionable steps to make something big. But I wanna hear their biggest, scariest ideas and be able to make those ideas into reality. And then again, put it onto their extracurricular list or their activities list. And there's a delicate balance because we don't want to just do something for a resume. I mean, that's important. We are kind of Machiavellian, I'm going to be honest, and say sometimes I will tell my students, like, listen, just do it. It's going to look fabulous. It's going to look great. It's going to really impress, uh, you know, the admissions officer. But this is also a time for exploration. It's a time to see if you really do want to be an architect or an engineer or a research scientist or an entrepreneur. Um, but it is, again, that delicate balance. We want to make sure that we are including things that are going to jump off the page and really grab their attention. You know, when it comes to students, a lot of students are athletes or in debate or model UN, you know, again, they kind of blend. And the kiss of death, frankly, is when an officer that's reading your essay or reading everything else says, yeah, you know, they're like many others, strong candidate, but not unique. 
where you can make yourself really stand out and unique is in this list. Um, and that's something that you can't really do two months before you apply. It needs to be something that's done with forethought, with intentionality and something ideally that starts on, honestly pretty young in your high school career, maybe even before your high school career. Right. I think that's a really important thing to realize, I think, is just kind of how important these activities are starting from super early. I think a lot of parents and students will start worrying about their GPA super early. They'll start test prep super early because they think those are the most important parts of the application. But like you said in the beginning, those aren't going to help differentiate you if you want to actually stand out. It's this activities list and your essays that are actually going to be doing that. Absolutely. And what I often tell my students, that those are check marks. You know, you need to have a great GPA, ideally from, with course rigor, from ideally from a fantastic school. You need to have strong st scores if and when you're, uh, you know, applying with them. And of course, this year's a little bit of an asterisk uh, in the grand scheme of things. But, you know, ultimately having a 36 or a 1600, unless it's a test blind school, isn't going to hurt you. But what really is going to make the decision that much easier and to get your admissions officer to really advocate for you in committee are the things that you do, the impact that you have, the things that differentiate you, that makes you someone that they want to have on campus, that they want to have a member of their community, that they know is going to be a fabulous alumni, um, and a really great representative for the school. Now, of course, when it comes to larger schools, um, they might be a bit more stats focused. You know, when you're reviewing 100, 100,000, 60, 80,000 applications, it's a little more difficult to be holistic. And frankly, that's why some of those schools are really going to struggle and have somewhat resisted going test optional. They're not going to really be looking at, they just don't have the time or the, um, you know, the people needed to really go through and evaluate each candidate individually the same way that the top 10, top 20 schools do. Um, so ultimately, it really can be a differentiating point and it really can be the difference between getting in and not, um, or you know, being waitlisted or not. So it is something that's really important and it's something that's short, um, but it's really impactful and it's something that kids should absolutely spend time on. Um, and I often tell my students, even starting in ninth grade, especially in the candidacy building, to keep a running, living document of all the things that you've done and to be as specific as possible whenever possible. So when you say that you grew the membership, by how much? How many numbers? What percentage? You raise money? Fabulous. How much? How much more than this year than last year? That you have um, donated something great how much how many you know what so we want to get super specific whenever possible we want to make sure that we are including data whenever possible um and i tell my students again when they start writing this or when they're writing their own resume i don't want you to worry about and be constrained by the, the character count there's a lot of ways that we can work to get those character counts down using ampersands and plus signs and using semicolons instead of the word and, I mean, that saves you, you know, four or five characters. Um, that's important when you only have 50 or, you know, 100, 150. And it's something that we want to have that detail. We think that we're going to remember everything, but frankly, two years later, you're not going to remember exactly the dollar figure that you raised. Um, so it's something that should be a living document and it should continue because I think that even when students are in university and in graduate school, you should always have a resume that you're continuously updating throwing things in there, whether it's the books that you've read, or again, the accomplishments, awards, accolades, all of it needs to be included. Right. So speaking of kind of that intentionality and the detail, you know, like you're talking about, it's a very short space, you know, you have to be very detailed and very careful about what you're doing. And you spoke about this a little bit earlier about the order of activities. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is something that a lot of students don't think about enough. So I'm hoping you can kind of talk about the strategy of the order, what types of activities should go first, um, kind of those really nitty gritty details. Absolutely. This is more art than science. So it's certainly take everything that I'm saying and, you know, kind of layer in on there where you want 
what you want to show. This is an opportunity. We're communicating over pieces of paper and trying to paint a three-dimensional picture. That's a challenge. Um, but certainly, and you might because most students have both a macro strategy of what their persona is, but we also have what I call a micro strategy, that each school, we might have a slightly different major, we might have different applications, you know, different personas, kind of not entirely different, you're not switching from one person to another, but maybe you're applying for econ, at a school like UCLA that doesn't have an undergraduate business school, and you're applying for a business at Berkeley, which does have a business school, or you're applying to NYU to Stern, or you're trying to apply maybe as a PPE or you know a, a econ major somewhere else. So depending on your activities, the biggest, most time-consuming ones, the ones that you've invested the most in, are almost certainly going to be the ones that you put on the top. Um, those are going to be the ones that are, you know, that you've spent, maybe it's a, maybe you worked a full-time job. Absolutely include that, especially if it's on task and especially if it's kind of on brand or on persona, but really think about what you want them to know first. And just like resumes, which can sometimes run into three, four pages, people pay the most attention to the first things that they see. So you want your first two, three, four activities to be the ones that are, are your heavy hitters, that if they stop reading right there, that they have gotten enough information about you, that even if they stop, they already know more or less where you're heading and what makes sense and why it makes sense and why you've well supported the fact that you should be applying as an entrepreneurship major or a finance major or a policy major or poli sci or econ or neuroscience, whatever it is. So if you're applying as a neuroscience major and you've done neuroscience research, that should probably be number one. Maybe number two, if you had a full-time job or maybe you also won some humongous award competition for something that is maybe in computational biology, not exactly the same, but close enough. Um, so really making sure that we have, um, you know, really thought about what is the most important and is most on point. And then again, going again in roughly descending order, certainly things that you've done for longer duration of time, you know, started in ninth grade, done it all the way through senior year, that's going to kind of boost something up. Something that you only did one week a year, even for four years, that might kind of lower it down. Back to that quirky kind of, you know, I ride a unicycle or I, you know, I'm a, I've been in baking competitions, even though it has nothing, you're not a culinary arts major, maybe that should be number eight, nine, ten. Um, so there's not a perfect analytical scientific way that I can add all this in and it spits out an order. It really is using some logic. It's using some strategy. Um, and again, that strategy and that logic might be a little bit different for each of the schools that you're applying to. Um, it doesn't need to be universal. One of my favorite marketing professors when I was at Columbia, one of the first things that he ever said to us is that be really careful about trying to please everybody. Because if I took a poll of people in our class at the time of what kind of tea they want, whether hot tea or iced tea, and then you average out the temperature, nobody likes lukewarm tea. So you wanna really figure out, again, if you're applying for a specific major, you might have a slightly different activities list, just like you might have a different essay. And the same thing if you're applying to another place that's a different kind of major. Uh, but for the most part, again, things that you spend a lot of time in, things that are really important and are typical and topical, to me, topical to your major, are really what are going to be on the top. You have to assume that they may not be looking at everything with a level of detail and really rapt attention that we would like. So we want to make sure we grab that attention in the first couple ones. Right. It's kind of about making that first impression because admissions officers are reading hundreds of applications. They're going to be skimming quickly. So if they see your first couple activities and they're kind of bored, they might skim even faster. So you want to make sure, you know, you're right on it right away. Exactly. And frankly, if you want to be a research scientist and you've done research, that shouldn't be number 10 <laughs> at all. Because like you said, they may not get there. So we want to make sure that we're kind of force feeding and spoon feeding, better than force feeding, spoon feeding them that information and giving it to them right on top. So they're skimming. I mean, imagine 
what it's like to read thousands of essays and review thousands of applicants in an afternoon. Just think about how you feel when you're reading a textbook or a really boring book. Um, your eyes kind of glaze over. You're not. You're paying attention, but sometimes you have to go back a couple times because you're reading but not really actually acquiring information. So we want to grab their information. You can see, grab their attention, and we want to grab it pretty quickly. So making sure that we include the things that are going to be grabbing their attention and kind of waking them up from that stupor, um, that's definitely what we want to have on top. Yeah, for sure. So speaking of kind of, you know, using your space effectively and everything like that, and we've talked about descriptions a little bit, but I'm hoping you can, um, you know, give a little bit more information, you know, other than, you know, data-driven kind of impact, um, other things that you should include in your activities descriptions, things that students need to make sure they cannot leave out when they're describing their activities. Yeah, I mean, you want to make sure that it's, unless it's something that's really clear, like if you row crew or you're on the hockey team, like that's sort of self-explanatory. You don't need to say hockey is a game that's played on the ice. And I would, you know, like you don't need to be overly um, detail oriented, but if it's a unique project, if it's a unique research, um, if it's a something that you've created, you definitely want to include some kind of basic level detail. And again, I tell my students, please don't worry about the character count at first. Um, the way I look at it, I, I like to cook. So I sometimes use food analogies. When you're trying to make like a broth, you need to start with a lot of volume and a lot of flavor, but you want to boil that down and it, it concentrates that flavor. The same thing with this. If you start off just trying to keep it really small, like just like if you only want to make a cup of broth, you don't start with a cup. You start with four or maybe even eight cups. Um, same thing with this. We want to start big. We want to start super detailed. And then we're going to have to make some really tough judgment calls about what can stay in and what can't, because that character count isn't a suggestion. It's a rule. So you do not want to exceed that character count because you're not going to be able to include that. There's other things that we can do. Like for instance, if you started an app, if you have a website, you can put a link either in activities or in additional information. So you do have an opportunity perhaps to communicate a bit more beyond those 150 characters. But whenever possible, we want to really be really boiled down, condensed, powerful, impactful. Every character counts. Um, and really making sure that we're being, again, extremely intentional. But that's where the guidance of former admissions officers and graduate coaches really can help because sometimes what a student might identify as really important may not actually be the most salient point that we need to get across. Um, so it's a delicate balance and it's definitely what I call iterative. We might go back and forth. It's something that we might discuss. It's very rare that I have a student be able to create a list and be done um, with one, you know, what rough draft does not often become final draft. Usually it's pretty close, um, but it definitely takes a lot of conversations and making sure that I, as their graduate coach, really understand what was important, what was their role, what do they do, what do they accomplish. I don't want to necessarily know about the tasks that they did, you know, got to the meeting, drank coffee. No, I want to know what did you accomplish? And it's hard. You're boiling down sometimes, you know, 20 hours a week for 40 hours, excuse me, for 40 weeks a year for four years. And you have to boil that down into a very small amount of time. And it's hard sometimes when you're kind of emotionally attached to it, um, you could struggle. And that's why it's good to have somebody, whether that if you're not using, you know, our services, obviously, someone like your guidance counselor, your college counselor, your teacher to really help you kind of get to that you know, really concentrated, impactful, short <laughs> description. It's important. Yeah, I think it's helpful to have an outside perspective because I like what you said, because you have to kind of think about, you know, you're not the one evaluating your application. You have to think about your audience. You know, what are the people reading this going to think? You kind of have to think outside of yourself or your immediate circle. Absolutely. And, you know, that's why things like titles matter, you know, and that's why, um, you know, ultimately, ideally, 
we do have things on there that aren't typical that no one else has done. So not just model UN and debate and speech or, um, you know, key club and future business leader in America. Again, not that those things aren't fabulous, but they don't need explanation. They're already known. Um, it, that's a little bit easier to describe than when you started your own business or your own app or you have done research projects or academic mentorships, but there are, are definitely are some best practices that we use and we definitely make sure that our students aren't struggling. This is not something, regardless of whether you have formal assistance, you should definitely have the guidance of somebody like, again, like a guidance, no pun intended, but a guidance counselor would be somebody who I would definitely recommend going to only after you've done the work. Don't go there with a blank sheet of paper. Go there with a lot of information, too much information. Again, it's fine. And have them help you strategize what to keep on and what not to. And the other frustration, frankly, is that most students have more than 10 activities. So it's kind of like choosing your favorite child. <laughs> you know, you don't want to give those things away. You spent a lot of time. So it is a process that can have a little bit of pain with it. Um, but it's definitely worth examining each thing and making sure that it's something that is going to get you closer to your goal, which is getting a yes from admissions. Right. Like we keep talking about, it's a very kind of, you know, it's stressful. It's a very detailed um, process. So it does take a lot of hard work. And like you said, some emotions if you're very attached to it. Yeah. Um, so before we go, I'm hoping we can also kind of speak to younger students as well. I know we have touched on this a little bit with the work we do with students in candidacy building, but um, you know, obviously, like you said, once you get to this point, once you're writing your activities list, you really can't change anything. You've done your extracurriculars, you know, it's kind of done. But for younger students, um, you know, they have a, several years to build up this profile. So, do you have any advice, I guess, on? you know, how to build that profile from a young age, you know, what activities are best, maybe what activities students should avoid? Sure. I mean, I think that people should, it's a dual edged sword, right? You definitely want students to explore things that they want to explore. It shouldn't all be about resume building, but of course, I mean, we are in the business of application, um, you know, counseling. So we can't take ourselves completely out of that. So I do tell my students, if you know exactly what you want to do and exactly what you, where you want to be, then let's work towards that. And let's think of unique ways that we can explore your area of interest that is uniquely yours. And the other thing to bear in mind is that you don't necessarily have to do that on your own. So maybe you have an interest in space and there's no space club on your campus. I mean, you can certainly join um, and there's definitely activities that you can do like through NASA and other things, but maybe you want to do something with that. They might be other people that you've met through the competitions that you've done at NASA, at the competitions that you may have done locally. You might find other people and then you can make something that's codified that shows and doesn't just tell that you have an interest. And that really is the mantra that kind of goes through all of application. You want to show not just tell. So if you say, hey, I'm super interested in insert subject area here, well, show me. Where have you demonstrated that? Um, so for younger students, the world's the limit. You know, there's really no limit to it. And, you know, I think oftentimes kids have these great ideas, but they don't know where to start, so they just don't. So I really enjoy developing action plans that take those ideas that might be floating around in their head, get them out of their head, first onto a document of these are the steps that we need to take. Finding resources. Those resources can be your family, it could be your friends, it could be your classmates, it could be your teachers, it could be the leadership at your school, and finding ways to really demonstrate that interest. Um, I always tell my students that and we talked about it before, that sometimes the kiss of death can be like many others. You don't just want to be typical. Now, does that mean that you pick up the unicycle as a hobby just to make yourself look cool? I don't know. That's not really a strategy that I would advocate across the board. But certainly taking things and increasing the impact, reaching more people is really important. And that could be challenging because that's a really fuzzy concept. But by, again, thinking about how do I want to share this with the world, whether that is starting a blog 
creating an app, starting a club. Maybe it's a club that's through your school. Maybe it's through your community. Maybe it's online. Starting a community, even starting a Reddit, subreddit, excuse me, or starting um, a Discord. You know, really my goal is, is to kind of work and with what my student is interested in. I'm not trying to create personas and personalities and uh, candidacy out of thin air. I'm trying to help them express what they are very interested in and finding a way that both works for them that they're excited about because they have to do the work it's not just putting on the resume they actually have to do it so they need to like it and they need to enjoy it and be enthused about it um, and excited about it it's also a way to explore things that you might find you know what i actually thought i really was interested in architecture i like pretty buildings i hate architecture and that's fine. <laughs> and honestly, you know, that's what you should be doing at 15, 16. You should not, I mean, there's plenty of 30, 40, and 50 year olds who have no idea what they want to be when they grow up. So if you're not sure exactly what you want to major in and you have really wide interests, I would tell you two things. First of all, explore a bunch of different things because again, we're only including 10. It's never a loss of time to explore an interest. And the other thing is, is that focus broadly on leadership communication. So doing things that are just leadership based um, is never going to be something that we would not include. It doesn't matter if you're a business major, a biology major, an engineering major, a philosophy major, leadership is something we're going to include. So if you're not sure, stay a little kind of generic in leadership, but if you know what you want to do, find a way you know, we call it, I don't love the name, but we call it a passion project. Um, But finding a unique way that you can take what is your passion, that's the name, and making it something that's uniquely yours. And really, again, you can involve other people. You don't need to be the only person doing this. Um, You could build a team that also is a demonstration of leadership. And you might find that there's subsets of it that you enjoy more than others, or you might not find that you enjoy it at all, but do it. You know, you'll never regret taking those risks. And again, like we were talking about before, it is challenging when I find a kid that's going into their senior year, that's a fantastic candidate, but does, hasn't shown what it is that the admissions officer officer is looking for that I know that had I worked with that kid two years ago, that they would be in a very different place. Um, And a lot of times we get bad advice. Um, It could be even from college counselors and from parents and everyone who's well-meaning, but we can often, kids often get well bad advice. You need to be well-rounded. Well, not really. You need to be egg-shaped. And what we mean by that is that I don't want you joining every club and by looking at your activities list, I don't know what you want to do because you've joined clubs in every single different discipline, humanities and hard sciences and business and everything that you can imagine and volunteer work and policy and politics. Um, Not to say that doing different things and having disparate interests is not good, but even better having all that, but having an area that you're egg shaped, that you're heavy. So if you want to do something that's based in policy, then certainly make sure that you're demonstrating that show, don't tell. If you want to do something um, about econ or about science, show, don't tell. Do some research, read books, even take online courses. I mean, obviously right now, the world is not exactly normal, unfortunately. So we need to get creative in terms of what we can do. We can't do the same things. Kids can't do the same things that normally they, they would do. Summer programs were canceled or online. Not ideal, but certainly there's always an area of opportunity that we can find, a silver lining, um, and find ways to really express your interests in measurable and impactful ways. Um, but that could be anything, which can be almost overwhelming because you can get a, you know get stuck in analysis paralysis. Don't worry about it being perfect. Don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. Just get started. Yeah, I think that's really the best advice is just kind of getting started and exploring. I think a lot of people think, you know, they need to do this activity and do it perfectly and then they have to stick with it forever. But, you know, that's not necessarily true. And I think especially what's important about what you said is not just doing things for the application, not just doing things to build your profile. I think 
for admissions officers, they'll probably kind of see right through that and they'll be able to tell if you're not really passionate about it. So, you know, if you do have an interest in something, it's likely that, you know, those passion projects or that really hard work is going to kind of come naturally anyway. Absolutely. And they absolutely can sniff out those that are just kind of faking it. You know, we actually need to make it. We need to show them something extraordinary whenever possible. And that bar gets higher every single year. But again, like you said, it isn't just about the resume. We do keep that in mind, but it's also about the exploration. It's about figuring out what you want to do and honestly, what you don't want to do too. So, you know, internships, co-ops, summer programs, all these things are super valid. So I don't want to take away from things that you can sign up for that you don't have to create at a whole class. But I definitely encourage students whenever possible to have at least one, maybe two things that they've done that no one else has done. You know, we want something that is really unique, um, preferably, obviously, very much on brand and really uh, on, makes sense. You know, obviously, if you want to major in, you know, econ, probably don't want to spend a tremendous amount of time in a lab studying genetics or vice versa. So making sure that it is on point, but absolutely do something that is unique, special, jumps off the page. Again, I tell them, put yourselves in the shoes of the person who's reading. And there's a lot of kids that they just kind of all blend into each other. You want to be the one that they're thinking about, you know, and advocating for. You want to make them your biggest champion. And the best way to do that is to give them a reason to champion you. Right. Like we've been saying this whole time, I think kind of the thesis statement is that the activities list is a really important part of your application to standing out and to being remembered among all of those, you know, hundred students and pieces of paper. Right. And while, you know, just like a GPA, you can't really change much of it by the time that you're applying. The difference is that you can't interpret your GPA, right? GPA is a number. Mm -hmm. It's it's there. I mean, yes, you can layer on school and rigor, fine. There is some interpretation, but you're not the one doing the interpretation. This is your opportunity to communicate what it is that you've done. It always has to be truthful, a thousand percent. You know, never lie, never exaggerate. Be honest uh, every single time. You will get your offer rescinded. So do not, do not make anything up. But You can certainly pull out of it the aspects that are going to present yourself in the best possible light. And you don't have that opportunity to layer on to your GPA like, oh, well, you know, I got a B, but this is a teacher that never gives A's. You don't have an opportunity to say that to an admissions officer, but you certainly within your activities list, you do have an opportunity to kind of just show the pieces of each of your activities that it's going to be most on brand and most impressive. Um, And that's what you want to focus on. Right. It's really, like we've been saying this whole time, that detail, um, the way you write it, the way you order things, that is super important. Yeah. Um, Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. I think um, this was a really great kind of well-rounded look from, you know, ninth grade on of how you can kind of build up your activities list. And um, I think, I hope especially our rising seniors listening to this will get um, a lot out of this for advice on, you know, kind of crafting and writing that activities list. Absolutely. It was such a pleasure to share that with you. And absolutely. It's one of those things that, well, I don't want somebody's entire high school experience to be only goal oriented about getting into college. I think that just a little bit of strategy and a little bit of forethought goes a really long way. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm always excited when I see someone who's really, you know, been passionate about even if it's singular. And I think often they're worried that they're not well-rounded. Um, and that's fine. That's not necessarily what we're looking for. We're looking for deep abiding passion. We're looking for strong support of those interests. Um, and, you know, this is definitely a very important piece of that pie and a great way to be able to really communicate what your priorities are. Um, so it's something that it doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't have to, but definitely needs to take a lot of forethought and a lot of time to actually create the activities. I mean, the actual activities list creation doesn't take time. The actual activities mm-hmm. could take a tremendous amount of time, um, but it doesn't have to be overwhelming. You know, take a step back, have some perspective, 
ask for advice of people preferably who know what they're talking about, not just someone who's just going to give you advice that doesn't know what they're talking about. And like most things, you want to keep in mind who your eventual audience is and what they're looking for. You know, put yourself in their shoes. What would you want to hear? Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, just some quick notes to wrap up as usual. Uh, we have a lot of great articles about the activities list that kind of go more in depth on a lot of the things we've been talking about today, about order, about deciding which activities to include since there's only just 10. Uh, and I will link our blog in the episode description. As always, if you have any questions or you'd like to request a topic for a future episode, you can go ahead and give us a follow, send us a message uh, at Ingenious Prep Anywhere. I will also include a link to our uh, free consultation sign up. We've talked a lot today about our former admissions officers, our candidacy building. If any of those programs sound interesting to you, I would highly recommend signing up for a free consultation to learn more and get some advice. That's all for now. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next time as we continue our journey inside the admissions office.